Uh, John is way too kind. I'm, I'm just a poor country surgeon trying to get by and yeah. do the best I can for my patients. I've uh, really enjoyed the talks today. Each and every one of these talks have been outstanding and, and really hit home because it's a lot of things that we try to do, not as well as the people who gave the talks. The last, the last talk on nutrition, I think, is uh, incredibly important, and we've really pushed this for at least the past 10 to 15 years. So I'm here to talk about uh, perforated diverticulitis and whether or not we need to do a Hartman's procedure and just to see what is kind of there. I have, I have no conflict of in interest. Sir Henry Royce was a genius. If he could have been a surgeon, I think all of our surgery would be vastly different today. He uh, basically changed a smoking, loud, non-functioning automobile to something that would function and function quite well. This is a picture of Henry Royce and a, and a gentleman named Charles Johnson in 1904 in one one of his, as a matter of fact, his earliest car. I've actually had the privilege of riding in this very car because it's still going uh, here well over 100 years later. It's, uh, it's not a modern car, but it still goes. And the main thing that Henry Royce emphasized to his people and what we should emphasize is that we accept nothing nearly right or good enough. Always strive to do better. If it doesn't do better, create it. And that's kind of what a lot of the stuff you've heard today is actually all about. Diverticular disease of the colon is an important cause of hospital admissions in the United States and all of Western civilization. Majority of the patients actually with diverticulitis can be treated medically, and many with diverticulitis, particularly stage one, can be treated uh, medically with, uh, and have very minimal complications. When we get to patients who have stage three and stage four, they, then they need a little bit, uh, Hensley stage three and four, they need more treatment. Uh, luckily, only five to 10% of these patients ever require surgery, and this is due to the complications of abscess, peritonitis, sepsis, fistula, bleeding, and obstruction. How is complicated diverticulitis defined? Um, Hospital, I think these patients are hospitalized for the most part. They've had to have IV antibiotics to improve. And most importantly, as we learned from Ambrosetti years and years ago, uh, they need to have a CAT scan which will show localized sigmoid thickening, uh, an inf inflammation of the pericolic fat, an abscess with peritonitis, extraluminal air or contrast, a fistula, a large phlegmon, and something that a lot of us forget about, and the reason the last talk was so important, is the ileus. The ileus will prevent the patient from being able to eat and take in proper nutrition. And this is one of the most important things for me to look at other than the other basics that have been outlined. Charles Mayo was the first to really have a, a, any kind of report on diverticulitis in 1907. Telling and Gruner in 1917 had an extensive report on the same thing. Actually, lavage and drainage is not new. It was first offered in 1950s with open surgery and with less than great antibiotics, and it was an absolute disaster. These patients did terrible, so much that the standard of care for acute perforation, regardless of whether it was massive peritonitis or not, became the Hartman's procedure um, with some of its problems. In 1991, uh, Moises Jacobs, Gus Pacencia, and I started looking at this and said, you know, we have laparoscopy now, we have a little bit better antibiotics now, maybe we don't have to do a Hartman's procedure with open surgery on all of these patients with perforation and with stage with Henshi 3 um, uh, peritonitis. So 
we started a study, prospective study, in 1991 uh, involving laparoscopic lavage and drainage with a certain criteria of what we would do, how we'd look at it. The difference between what they did and what I did was that they, they checked for a perforation with a proctoscope each time. And in 1997, we had the first report of this uh, uh, effort. Severe diverticular disease with with peritonitis is associated with, uh, when it's treated with a laparotomy, is associated with a 50% wound infection, at least a 45% incidence of hernia at the, in the side of the stoma, at least a 40% incidence of hernias in the, in, in the old midline incision. And we all know that up to 60% of these never get their colostomy closed. Um, there have been some efforts for, for primary resection, which have some promising uh, uh, outcome so far, but we're not quite there yet. So the treatment options for diverticulitis are medical treatment only, percutaneous drainage with the help of our radiology colleagues, open surgery, or laparoscopic surgery, where in laparoscopy, we will do lavage and drainage if need be, resection with or without an anastomosis as need be, and diversion with a Hartman's procedure if need be. These obviously, the last or latter are obviously patients for some reason or other that we feel are not candidates for any of the above. So the question becomes what to do, what to do with complicated diverticular disease with peritonitis? Do we, do we do the classic Hardman's procedure that you can see here? Or do we lavage? Or do we do something different as outlined in, in these other slides? We'll get to these and see what we can come up with. There have been many trials comparing, um, laparoscopic lavage with resection for perforated diverticulitis, all but one really favor the lavage uh, uh, theory. For example, the Diala uh, study sa said that lap laparoscopic lavage is a better option for perforated diverticulitis with peritonitis than resection and colostomy. I happen to agree with that. That's not the reason the study is here. This study just came out in 2018. But most importantly, it was from the British Journal of Surgery, and they don't accept papers that are not fairly good. This is a study of uh, consideration for Hartman's reversal, and this is looking at patients who had Hartman's procedure, looking at the other side of the coin. Uh, only 40%, 41% of the patients ever had subsequent restoration of bowel continuity. Uh, 121 of these, 46%, almost 50%, had post-reversal complications such as intradominal abscess, uh, surgical site infection, or anastomotic leak. So doing a heart must and say, look what a great surgeon I am, we can always put this together. Maybe you haven't done the patient the great favor you, you think you did. And their conclusion was that Hartman's procedure and reversal are associated with uh, significant morbidity uh, to the patient. We looked at initially at peritoneal lavage as a bridge, and this study actually uh, looked at this very carefully with a systemic review. And their conclusion was that lap peritoneal lavage should be considered an effective and safe option for treatment of patients with sigmoid diverticulitis and Henschey stage 3 peritonitis. And what I mean by bridge is let's get the patient over their super illness where they're toxic, sick, uh, uh, pH is off, their electrolytes are off, nutrition is not good. Try to get them over this particular uh, episode, then come back and do an elective procedure if, if need be uh, at some time in the future when they're in better shape and their complication rate may be lower. 
This is a multicenter international trial of laparoscopic lavage. Again, conclusions. Laparoscopic lavage showed a higher rate of successful sepsis control in selected patients with a low risk of operative uh, mortality, reoperation, and stoma formation. So what the poor old country boy was saying back in 93 or 94, John, uh, may not have been all just, just hot air. The Lola study was not quite as friendly. Uh, this was done by, by in the Netherlands, and the, that they felt even though they didn't support lavage, they felt that the medical cost for the patients who could be lavaged was later. As you remember, this is the study that missed a couple of cancers, their fault, not the patient's fault. And th these were uh, patients that uh, had less than complete lavage, uh, in my opinion. Just comparing that to what we have done, and this will be just one little brief thing, uh, John, not, not too drawn out. Won't bore you with any, any tapes. Our initial experience, the TEI, this is what we reported with, uh, uh, between Jacobs, Placentia, and myself. 18 patients in 1997. Uh, this is this paper was ignored by a lot of people for some reason. Uh, we devised the peritoneal cavity. No acute reoperation was required. No colostomy was necessary. No fistulas developed. And the 80, we found that 80% of the perf patients had sealed perforations. The translation of that is that you need to look for the perforation. If you don't look for the perforation, even the Lola study says that that's where many of these people get sick again. So you look for the perforation and repair it some way if the patient is not immun immunosuppressed. If they're immunosuppressed, that patient needs an ostomy, period. They don't need to have a swimming lesson. They need a life preserver. A subsequent report just of our, our patients were 40 patients, um, and you can see what it is. Uh, none of the patients required further operations. Uh, we did offer a colon resection to these patients. 50% uh, decided they would have that, 50% didn't, and it's pretty, we'll see a paper in a minute about what happened to the rest of those patients. Our next publication was in 2012 with 83 patients. Again, 25 of the uh, 42 patients who went, underwent, uh, uh, this was comparing directly laparoscopic lavage and laparoscopic Hartman's procedure. And we found that the colostomy rate in our group was higher because we worked with the patients, I think, a little bit more. 67 of these patients had Hensi 3 and 4. The others had abscesses that had to be drained. There was no doubt that the, high, the operating time for a Hensi procedure was higher. Um, uh, most of these patients came back 20, 25 out of 42 who had the lavage had a subsequent uh, colectomy. We are now standing at 105 patients. Um, our operating time has increased because we have increased the complexity of our of the patients that we accept. Our blood loss um, has been minimal. Hospital length of stay is about 6.6 .6 days, plus or minus. We've had three re-operations, being totally honest. Two were converted to open Hartman's because of the severity of the disease. They did not respond. By that, I mean that in two days, they were not a febrile. They were getting sicker, and they needed something else to do. Uh, 63 of the 105 uh, lavage patients underwent elective surgery for source co control of the, of the uh, diverticulitis. There was no morbidity, no mortality in this uh, particular group. So in conclusions, I think there's documented success with both laparoscopic colectomy as well as laparoscopic peritoneal lavage and drainage. I think in experienced hands, you can certainly do a laparoscopic uh, resection when, when, with good or better results. I think that laparoscopic lavage and drainage is suitable and safe for complicated diverticular disease with severe peritonitis. 
If you follow certain steps, make sure you lavage all cordons, make sure you see where you think the perforation is. That does not mean unroof all of the fibrinous adhesions, but it does mean explore the patient and be sure you look into each loop of bowel that is there. It has, this treatment needs to be individualized. It's got to be based on the patient's age, number of prior attacks, severity of disease, and, and comorbidities, with the latter being the most important. Some of you have seen me show this slide before. This is something I learned in, in uh, Australia. By, uh, this is called a fulpy that this is sitting on, which is a water tank that goes out to the sheep station. And it says, good, better, best, never let it rest till our, your good is better and your better best. And that's what we're all trying to do is be better surgeons for our patients. Thanks a lot.